Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is the arts uh, and Christians. And we have a very special guest, John Pretty. Uh, that's P-R-I-D-D-Y. I don't want to mislead people about anything about John. Anyway, John Pretty is uh, uh, CEO and co-founder of the Wind Rider Institute, which is a very interesting um, organization. John, we're really glad glad to have you. I'm going to introduce you here in just a second with, with some little facts about you, but I, I just want to say thanks for doing this with us. Great to be with you. Happy to... Uh, to always be on a talk with you, Daryl. Well, great to be with you. Uh, John is a successful entrepreneur and Peabody Award-winning film producer and is a leader in the creation and expansion of entrepreneurial comp- companies and the development of private and nonprofit enterprises. He's the executive producer – okay, this sounds exhausting – the executive producer of over 150 short films. Okay, that's a large number. That's that's. Uh, I won't ask you to name them all, uh, including the award-winning uh, abstraction, uh, the new Capernaum's web series, along with his brother Ed, is an executive produ- uh, producer of award-winning documentaries, and then there's a nice long list here of several things that you've done. So uh, John uh, lives in Boise, Idaho. So that's he's with us. Um, over Zoom, which is the way everything happens today anyway. And I mean, I could live in a boat, boys, and we'd probably still be on Zoom. Uh, And then uh, wife of, uh, this says 39 years, uh, four grown children, Master of Arts and Leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary, and you've been awarded the Brain Center Distinguished Alumni Award, uh, and you have your Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of Colorado. So you've been all around the West. Um, uh, So... So my opening question is always the same for everybody. How did a nice guy like you get in a gig like this? Well, I, I'm tired of hearing that bio as well. But anyways, <laughs> thanks, Daryl. It's good to be with you, yeah. and thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's fun to tell the story. You know, I'm a business guy by background. Uh, came out of the corporate world and then partnered with my two brothers, Mark and Ed, uh, to create a nutritional supplement company, which is how we got to Boise, Idaho back in the mid nineties. And, uh, we were kind of in the right place, the right time. We grew that company and it was acquired by a public company. And so I found myself at 40 years old, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I grow up and I got the idea that I know what I should do. I should go to seminary. So off I went to Fuller Theological Seminary. Uh, that's about the year 2000 and uh, was pursuing a master's of, uh, theology at Fuller when I really became interested in the power of story and how story is starting to shape our culture. And this is, you know, 20 plus years ago. And who would have known then where we would be at now today with all this technology and all the different ways that stories could be told. But the Windrider Institute was sort of built out of that foundation while I was at Fuller uh, to where we got the idea that we would go to the Sundance Film Festival, which is the largest independent film festival in the world. Uh, really focus on independent storytellers and uh, independent artists, and that we would go there, and so we did. And we took Fuller Seminary students, folks working on their master's, and then Biola University undergraduate film students with the idea that we would go to Sundance and we would uh, watch Sundance films and then come back and talk amongst ourselves. Hmm. 17 years later, uh, we are a full partner with the Sundance Institute, the Sundance Film Festival, This year, we did it virtually, and we had over 35 Christian colleges, theological seminaries, uh, pastoral and ministry groups join us virtually for the Windrider Forum and Summit at the Sundance Film Festival 2021. So um, we would have never imagined all those years ago that we would be here today, but uh, the power of story is really important uh, during this era and this time. So when you were first doing this and you were uh, initially taking the seminary students there, were, had you already made a move into, into telling uh, into for short films, or, or were you just interested in getting a window on kind of where the culture was, or was it both? Well, it was both, really, because 
my brother Ed and I started producing feature documentary films. And actually, we would find these films at film festivals that were that were created as short films. And then we would get to know the filmmakers and then partner with them to turn the short film, and in many ways, these were student films, um, and, and turn them into a feature film. And the very first film that we did was a film called To Die in Jerusalem. Hmm. Uh, and that film was acquired by HBO. And so right out of the blocks, we found ourselves in fortuitous space where we had made a feature documentary. HBO had come on board as a partner, and um, we started making feature documentary films in parallel to the work we were doing at Windrider. Now this and it was really, as, cool. as the years went by, the short form content sort of came after the fact. I see. So uh, uh, this may seem like a strange question, but I think it makes sense. So, so you're a business guy, right? And all of a sudden right. you're making films. Right. How much pre-preparation did you have? And I put pre on there on purpose. How much pre-preparation did you have to go into this space? Or was it a case of, of learning because you surrounded yourself with people who had been in the space? How did that work? It, it really was the latter. You know, we would uh, we were introduced to really talented filmmakers and by and large in independent film then, as is now sort of having, um, you know, partnerships with business folks to kind of get the creative process, I think, is a real asset. And so we came on sort of as the executive producer role, which is really the business guy mm -hmm. that comes in and, and partners with the artist. And so. Uh, if done well, you know, the uh, the collaboration between an artist, storyteller, and a person who has a bit of business acumen, that makes a lot of sense. But every film project is sort of like its own company. In fact, it's its own LLC. And so it, it runs like a business in so many ways. So there's a lot more synergy there uh, than maybe meets the eye. And then as time went on, we got uh, better and better at the, at the craft of filmmaking. But originally, we knew nothing about how to make a movie, but we knew... Um, how to spot talent when we see it, how to collaborate and, and create teams. And so those kinds of things worked well from the business background. You know, I think film is a wonderful metaphor for, for just the workspace in general. And, and what I mean by that is, is someone goes to a film, they see the actors, they get a sense of who the writers are, they certainly appreciate the way in which the direction comes on. But then you go through those credits at the end, in which there are literally hundreds of people who put something together. You only see the, you only scratch the top layered visible surface of what it takes to put on a film. Is that a fair description of kind of how it works? It, it's so true, and I really appreciate you talking about the credits, because at a film festival, actually, the audience doesn't leave until after the credits have rolled. Yeah, I don't That's either. It. I don't leave a film yeah. until I, after the credits have rolled, because I'm sitting here saying, the reason I'm able to enjoy this is because right. of all the names that are flashing before me on the screen. That's exactly right. Even if it's a simplistic, short-form, you know, easy film, documentary film, um, those credits at the end are important. And that is, you know storytelling filmmaking is an, an extreme collaborative art um it's the ultimate in in team making and team building you know i come out of a baseball background and i still love baseball played a lot of baseball coached a lot of baseball filmmaking is not unlike baseball which is you know the person who plays catcher is very different than the person who plays pitcher mm -hmm. and the person who plays right field is different than the person who plays third base but you need all of them and that's a good metaphor for really how, or an analogy, I should say, for how, how filmmaking works, that collaborative team. Yeah. So your director, your director may not be the best cinematographer, so he, he or she has to find the best cinematographer. Yeah, yeah exactly right. And, and actually, the way I use it as a metaphor is, think about what it takes. I, I, it's, trying to, it's an attempt to appreciate the average workspace, which is, think about what it takes for you to have a bowl of Wheaties in the morning. Okay, and just think about where that starts versus what that gets to you and how many people have touched that process along the way, something that you do every day, have a bowl of cereal or eggs or whatever it is, and all the different industries that are involved to make that happen, et cetera. And it's, it, it's kind of a celebration, what I call a celebration of the mundane, you know, uh, that, that and, and film with that art element on top of it is kind of the 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 example in my mind of of kind of what we're talking about what it takes to actually get to those you know 15 minutes or 90 minutes that a, where a person is is uh, hopefully both entertained and made to reflect on what life is all about which i'm assuming 
I'll talk about the name Windrider a second. I know I've heard you tell this story before. I think this is fascinating. Why Windrider? Well, you know, when we first started going to Sundance the, the, the year prior to bringing folks to Sundance, we really felt like the creative spirit uh, was alive and well um, within these independent films and within the filmmakers. And so we just think about Genesis 1, 2, the, the Hebrew word ruach, the, the wind of God that hovered over the earth, that creation, um, it sort of felt right to us because the creative spirit that was then is still now. And so we were very much the, uh, the followers of God's ruach, that creative spirit, the wind. And so wind riders uh, was who we endeavor to be, folks that were trying to pay attention to where God's spirit was moving in the creative process through these stories. And that's the origination of Wind Rider, that we would be those folks that would ride God's wind. And it's so true. Even when we go to Sundance every year, we don't know. Nobody has seen these films. You know, we haven't uh, we haven't engaged with them yet. And so uh, we only go based on curating these films based on little, you know, bios on the pro- uh, in the program. So uh, the films come to us very new. And so we explore them. Uh, in that new creative way, and so that's the inception of Windrider. Yeah, and the, and the, just the theological, I don't know if it's the sidebar or added addition to that, is, is that when we think about people made in the image of God, one of the things that makes people in the image of God what they are in the creation is this creative, reflective ability that God has given to people that we that many theologians do connect to the idea of being made in the image of God. And and this ends up being the expression of it. And then another thing, area and space that you work in that I think is fascinating to think about theologically, because everything that you guys are doing is just so beautifully tied to uh, thinking through the way creation works and what we might call um, general revelation or common grace, that space of looking for those things in in our lives and in the creation that make us reflect on life. You know, um, that the, that's the thing I really enjoy about the pieces that you all put together. I, I, I never walk away from a piece that you all put forward without reflecting on something that's going on around me. Well, thank you. You know, general revelation is an important part of how we view this. Common grace is an important part of how we view our work. But also, uh, the starting point is a bit different in how we come at, uh, you know, cinema storytelling. You know, so often in the church, we start with Scripture and then work our way out from Scripture uh, to the topic at hand. But in our space, we reverse that. We even say, you know, theologians will appreciate this, the Dr. Craig Detweiler, one of our co-founders, calls it reversing the hermeneutical flow. Yeah. And really, it's starting with the content, the story itself, in this case, film, and working back to Scripture. And we see when we do that, general revelation and common grace are more self-evident when you start with that commonality and work back to our to the scriptures, as opposed to starting only with text and moving forward that way. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I've just done a book called Cultural Intelligence, in which the last chapter talks about how the church needs to do a better job of teaching by what I call switch hitting. You mentioned baseball. So, you know, most seminaries teach their students to go from text to life, but most people read their Bible by going from life back to the text. Right. So that's why stories step into that space because they they take you to that place and then you go from there and 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 the appeal was we need to do a better job of understanding the Bible canonically enough that we're able to take life as it's dished to us and make sense out of what's going on theologically and I think some of the some of the things that you do take people there, um, but it's interesting. They don't always take them there through words. They take them there through images and storytelling, et cetera. And I do think that one of the things that's happened, at least in my lifetime, and John, I'm, uh, I guess it's true for you as well, is is that the importance of story has really um, – it's always been with us. But there's a sense in which, with all the technology that we have today, et cetera, that there are just a myriad of additional ways to get at story than was the case, say, 200 years ago. Well, I think that's right. I mean, we really started seeing this trend about 20 years ago when we were beginning to get involved with film. And and what was happening was there was – they called it democratization of production, where – 
production equipment, which was always really, really expensive. The cost of production equipment, cameras and such, lighting were coming down. Um, and so it was easier and easier for people to make a film. Then there was democratization of the editing uh, hmm. equipment, which back when we started, you hired an editor who lived in New York or Los Angeles, who had an editing suite. And um, with all this fancy equipment prior to that, they were literally cutting uh, film, literally with scissors. That's right, because so it was literally film. It was. It was <laughs> yeah. Film. They were, yeah. They were, I yeah. Mean, maybe uh, all the under 20s just on. asked what we just described. So anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you say cutting and splicing film, like you and I get it, if you're <laughs> Many younger people were like, what is cutting and splicing film? But they actually did that. Yeah. So that all began to change the de democratization of the production side, then the democratization of the of the editing side. So that all happened. So production costs were coming down, which means and the equipment was becoming lighter. So now you could more easily tell stories because you could go there with fewer people. The, the thing that was still not caught up to that was the distribution model and yeah. still lagging. But we did not predict um, these platforms, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Apple TV, so on and so forth. We didn't have the bandwidth, technological bandwidth for those when this was all happening. Now we do. You mentioned YouTube and others. And so now you really have the ability to make a film, tell a story and, and distribute it so that people would see it. And that is happening in, in real time. And then, of course, with the pandemic of late, people were, I mean, I do this. Like, what are we watching? Like, what what can we watch? Because we, we watched, one night I turned to my wife and I said, I'm done with Netflix. I watched it all. Nothing, <laughs> nothing left. Yeah. yeah. Nothing left. So now we have, uh, you know, uh, people who are have grown accustomed to watching content uh, on these various platforms, on a TV, on a laptop, on a computer. And that's the change that's taken place. And it's accelerated in the last 12 months, like uh, 10 years of acceleration. That's amazing, because when I think back to this conversation, I think back, you know, when I was growing up, there were three networks. There were a handful of movie studios and a handful of places to go watch movies. Uh, and that was it. And today, I find myself amazed at you know, all the different, what, niche, uh, almost niche um, uh, platforms that exist to distribute the stuff. And each one of them is taking on the responsibility of producing content that is uniquely theirs. So there's a mammoth growth, I'm assuming, in demand for a variety of stories come a variety. So things that, when there were only three networks, would never have made it on. Because the because the the um, what the co the uh, lane was so tight, it's like being on a two lane highway. Now, all of a sudden, you got an eight lane or ten lane highway, and a lot more stuff coming at you as a result. A lot more possibilities, and then of course you've mentioned the distribution. I was going to actually you've actually anticipated a question I was going to ask, which is how has the film industry changed since you started versus where you are? And you've basically just walked us walked us through that very, very beautifully. And, and uh, you know, I, I think this is fascinating for people because I think most people consume, you know, what gets produced, but they actually have very little understanding of what it takes to produce something. So, so that's kind of my next question, and that is, um, what is, what is what it, <laughs> take us through the steps of what it takes to produce something. You know, sometimes you hear an award in an award story, something like this, this has been a 10-year journey, you know, and you're going, 10 years? Really? You know, so how does that happen? Well, I guess I would start by saying this. Anytime a film gets made, it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> could be a minor miracle. could be a major miracle. I, I'm amazed that films get made. Uh, it's a very difficult process to hmm. make a film. And it, it's... Um, a lot of things don't get made it, you know, it's just, it's a difficult process. It's one of the most challenging processes I've ever been a part of. And the many things that I've been able to do in my life, just getting a film made. So I always acknowledge whenever we're at a film festival and this Sundance is of course, we're super fans of Sundance, but I always tell the filmmakers, you know what? Well, we're happy to be a part of your miracle. Cause you got your, you got this movie made. And it makes me think of the film burden, which won the audience award two years ago at, Sundance and uh, we've gotten very 
close with the filmmaker Andrew Heckler. In fact, that film is now on um, Showtime. You can mm. watch the film Burden, and I highly recommend it. It's very graphic, very difficult, very challenging film, but it's an amazing film. But he wrote the film 25 years ago hmm. uh, based on a true story. And the film, from the day he started to write the film to the day the film that you can see it, has been 25 years. Wow. And that's pretty extreme example, but yeah. you know, funding fell out a couple of times on that and just different barriers that happened along the way but the filmmaker was called to make that film he had a you know a sense that no matter what happened someday he would make that film and he did and so these independent filmmakers function and, and if they feel somewhere between an entrepreneur uh, meets a missionary meets a pastor <laughs> they're just compelled they're huh. compelled interesting and you need somebody has to be compelled to make a movie uh, and 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 not give up on it. And if that's not the case, the movie doesn't get made. Interesting. Yeah, it I, it it does strike me as being quite an. I mean, I think about. Uh, I I know nothing about script writing, but I do know that if you take a book and try and make it into a movie, it's got to go through a transformation to get from A to B. And just at that level, don't mention anything else. That's before you even get to picking up a camera and doing anything with it. Um, and so that's an involved well, that, That's process. why they call it the best – that's a separate Academy Award for screenwriting, the best adopted screenplay. Yeah, exactly. It's separate than a best original screenplay because it's just tough to – it's equally as difficult to do uh, – Best adopted screenplay, I'm sure. Yeah. So, um, well, all that's kind of kind of background. Let me let me let me um, let's walk through. Um, well, let me ask you a general question before we dive into some particular films that I want to talk about that you all have have been involved with. Um, tell me what you are looking for when you <laughs> when you're thinking about do we do this or not? And what do, what do you what do you what are you aiming at? Well, there's two parts of what we do at Windrider. One aspect is we produce content, make a lot of films. We also curate and license content. Um, and so we have an ongoing library of films that we both made and films that we've curated and, and licensed uh, in, into our library. And we look for the same thing in both, whether we're making something or, or curating a film to license, which are we believe at Windrider, we're endeavoring to find films, make films and find films that open up the highest potential for conversation around a topic. Hmm. And, you know, this aspect has been true for the entirety of time we've been working at Windrider, but never more important than today with this extreme polarization in our culture. Um, everybody is coming from a binary perspective these days. I shouldn't say coming from, sort of being forced into binary groups, tribal groups, and we're no longer having conversations around a topic. And so for us, the selection process of stories we choose to make, the selection process of stories we choose to license are stories that take an issue that's really important today, and in particular important to people of faith, but to everyone in general, universal importance, and a story that could transport us outside of these binary groups and into a more directional thinking through conversation and those conversations that we have are with the filmmakers or the characters or subjects of the film. And so that's what we're looking for. That's our, that's our runway that we try to try to always stay in is, is creating conversation. Okay. So let me, let me talk about uh, uh, three different pieces uh, I, I, and I'm going to flip the order. I was going to talk about them in cause you've talked about the polarization. The one that you have currently on your website um, is called for the love of neighbor. Um, uh, so, so talk about what that, uh, and, and I didn't get a chance to look at it cause I didn't, by the time I found it, I didn't have enough time. But but my understanding is it's about three different people in the public in the public service sphere, politicians um, at different levels, local and national. Um, tell me more about that. For the love of neighbor, I, uh, right now when I think of politics, that's not the first phrase that often jumps into my mind. Uh, so uh, so let's talk about what you're trying. What what why you saw that that uh, piece is valuable. Well, you're right. I mean, it's sort of a head tilt when you say you're going to because at, at Winrider, we try to stay out of electoral politics in general, uh, because once electoral politics enter into the conversation, 
there is no conversation. And so we've been really disciplined over the years to try to stay out of electoral politics. But uh, For Love of Neighbor was a film that was commissioned by the um, American Enterprise Institute um, and their faith in public life um, division, which is taking some of the very brightest young Christian uh, leaders in universities across the country and basically doing you know, a level of teaching and interaction around those that feel called to serve in, in the public realm. So for the love of neighbor was a film the filmmaker is a tremendous filmmaker. His name is Ryan patch, close friend of Wynn Ryder. In fact, there's another film uh, in our library called regulation narrative film that he did. It's fantastic. So I commend that to you, but for the love of neighbor was a way that a filmmaker could tell a story about three different people who come at public service in three different ways. And they did a great job of not coming at it in a politicized way that says it's either a Republican or a Democrat. It led with the idea of the value of public service. Yes. And um, and the high calling of public service and the reason why young people who are bent that way now need to be encouraged, not discouraged from going into that space. Because if you spend your time around the political environment, and you're watching any any of the news channels uh, or even, you know, social media you would be dissuaded from that. So this tells the story of three different people serving in three very different ways um, in the political spectrum and public service spectrum. And I, I think it's well done. And I think we need it. It feels like a tonic uh, or a healing bomb for why public service is important. Yeah, I'm attached to an organization here that's primarily local called Christians in Public Service, in which the attempt is to minister alongside public servants. And people who step into that role are under incredible pressures from constituents, um, you know, in terms of both the kinds of decisions they face, the expectations that that are had of them, uh, the way in which, um, at least in many Political environments today, you have to be constantly raising a lot of money in order to in order to run. Although they're under terrific pressure, and um, and so we've tried to come alongside them like um, almost like a chaplaincy with people who've done public service before. It's completely nonpartisan and and just trying to serve them as Christians alongside. And and I think it's a it, it's an aspect of public service that again most people aren't even it's it's like the filmmaking they aren't even aware of what that part of the, of a person's life is who who tries to go there and what what that can mean for them and the pressure that they're under so i was i was actually intrigued to see this because of that and i'm i'm actually looking forward to watching it so that's uh, that's a uh, that's a good example let me give you the second one this is the first piece that i ever saw that you all did and and i and i still have a soft spot in my heart for this it's beneath the ink uh, and 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 Billy Joe White, who just was an interesting character, and I just think his story is fascinating. So um, most people go beneath the ink. What in the world could that be about? Well, uh, beneath the ink, filmmaker is Cy Dotson. Uh, the the character in the film. It's a documentary short, only eleven minutes. And I saw the film for the first time at a film festival, I think three years ago. I've lost track of time. And I watched the film and I was just like blown away by it. It's the story of Billy Joe White, who lives in um, Appalachia, uh, Zanesville, Ohio. He's tatted up from head to toe. He owns the Red Rose Tattoo Parlor in Zanesville. Filmmaker Cy Dotson, who currently lives in Minneapolis, is also from Zanesville, Ohio. Hmm. When Cy was going back home to visit his dad in Zanesville, picked up the local newspaper and saw an article uh, that Billy Joe White was covering up hate tattoos free of charge uh, in his tattoo parlor. And so if you have a hate tattoo, uh, come on in and, and, and they'll cover it up and turn something awful into something beautiful. So the film shows people who are coming in with uh, swastikas on their body and Billy Joe turns it into uh, a flower or uh, a burning cross and a hooded Klansman that get turned into an American eagle. But, but the people, the, the, the outward change of those tattoos is one thing and an important thing. But the reason why the folks coming in to have those tattoos covered and the stories of their own transformation is, is really the heart of this story. Um, and one of the subjects in the film who had literally a burning cross and a um, hooded Klansman on his back 
said the reason why he wanted to have the tattoo covered it was he had a son he adopted an african american son hmm. and he did and he didn't want his african american son to ever see that on his back and so on the outside you have change and and on you know on the inside prior to that and we do what we call the w episode which is a talk you know a talk show with a filmmaker or subject of the film after each film and we the w episode with beneath the ink phil allen uh was moderating it great moderator for our shows and he basically said it feels like a uh, baptism hmm. to some extent you know like a new creation with that and so yeah beneath the ink side dots and billy joe yeah no nah, it's one. a great great piece and, and you know I, the <laughs> i'll put it this way you go watch that piece and you'll be hooked on wind rider because you'll understand yeah. what it's about i mean it's just amazing uh, amazing piece of film the the third the third one that i want to mention is kintsugi um uh and uh which which you all not only filmed and did a beautiful job with but um but also um it becomes a metaphor for uh, in some ways for um the human condition so um so talk about that one I, obviously the moment i say it people will go kintsugi that doesn't sound like an english word so let's start there kintsugi is not an english word it's uh, it's, Jap it's japanese mm -hmm. uh and it's uh I think Kent means gold and Sugi means mended or the other way around, one of those two things. But we work closely with Makoto Fujimura, who's a world renowned uh, artist. And we had been in Japan filming some uh, short films with Mako a few years back. And Mako um, really was interested in um, this movement, you know, theologically from creation to new creation. And he, was really talking about the art of kintsugi and the art of kintsugi is an ancient art in japan where they take the japanese um bowls and dishes and the various different things that are important to the japanese people and when they're broken a kintsugi master actually puts them back together using streams of gold hmm. and that the broken piece is now put to together in a way that makes it more valuable than before it was broken hmm. and Mako has really led the way uh, on Kintsugi and so the short film really tells tells his journey uh, of interacting with the ancient Japanese art of Kintsugi and he's re recently written a book called uh, Faith Plus Art A Theology of Making hmm. and in that is a chapter on Kintsugi and many other things that he's come at because that's that's how he's coming at the world as an artist um, you know, in this ground zero moments of our life, you know, he was there at 9-11 at, at ground zero. That's where his studio was. And so he's come at and then being a Japanese American, he was very close to all the earthquakes, tsunamis and all the things that took place in Japan. And so he has really come at the conversation around Kintsuki. But, but beyond that, which talking about what does it look like to process through trauma and the ground zero experiences of our life, it's very relatable. Yeah, and the beauty, of course, is is the is the the metaphor that you've already alluded to, which is that um, you know uh, people are broken, and and when when we're we're put back together, particularly when God puts us back together, it's something that's very 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 beautiful. Uh, and you know, I mean, how many how many films begin with uh, with a bowl being shattered on the on the ground? I mean, uh, you know, what, again, one of the things that's always interesting uh, in many of the pieces that I've seen is the open imagery is. Um, it is captivating and it catches you and you realize okay I've just I'm just being I'm just being introduced to a metaphor that I think is going to walk me through this this short um, and uh, and Kintsugi is a is a good example there's a there's another one that you've done and I and I don't remember the title of it all that I remember I, I think I've just seen the trailer I don't think I've seen the real thing but it's of a boy wandering through the creation um, mm -hmm. And uh, and and the discovery of I, I I guess the theme is going to be the discovery of beauty in life or something to that effect. Um, uh, you know, like I say, every time I every time I look at one of the things that you all do, um, there's an opening 
imagery or there's imagery somewhere in the piece that catches your attention and 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 you say you're there to generate conversations i go you watch these pieces there's no way you there's no way you can get away without talking about what it is that you've just seen so um yeah very very nice well that film's called wondrous by the way okay it's, uh, the filmmaker sebastian rogers and he does it's a it's basically a poem Hmm. And he does this amazing thing. It's only three minutes, I think three, four minutes. It's very short. And it's a, it's a little boy going through and, uh, you know, with wonder through the streets of Portland, actually, yeah. which is really uh, interesting given what's going on there today and uh, really beautiful. But it's an example how filmmakers uh, who come, in this case, from a faith perspective, really undergird good theology around a film that anybody could watch, wondrous, you know, yeah. you know you wouldn't think it was a Christian movie in any way, but it's really got good bones and infrastructure of, of good uh, theology under it. And so I think it's, uh, from that standpoint, it's really beautiful. That's interesting. If it's only three or four minutes long, then I probably did see the real thing. So, uh, you yeah. know, um, that, wow. Well, and, and part of the reason I went through some samples like this is to show really the array of things that you do. I mean, it's, um, you know, uh, I can't think of the last time a Christian thought thought theologically about the impact of a tattoo parlor. I just those two things don't normally come together in my mind. Uh, um, obviously, the political space is one that we often occupy, but the cross cultural nature of Kintsugi is is an interesting touch of seeing how another culture has developed a custom and and. Um, what was interesting today in trying to find the film because I knew that what the film was, but I had not, I did not recall the title because Kintsugi doesn't stick in your brain as an American, and uh, and so I was looking for the film, and when I went to look for the film to try and see if I could find it and find the title, I I googled Kintsugi. I, I, I first I determined that Kintsugi was probably what we were talking about by the descriptions of, of what I was seeing on the Google search, and then I went to the video section, and all of a sudden. A library of Kintsugi videos showed up uh, of all sorts, including a couple of Macos that he has worked on to explain what it is. And I'm here going, I just walked into a huge cultural space I didn't even know existed. Um, and, uh, and, and so that was fascinating. So the, the array of the variety of things that you all do is also amazing. So let me let – me, uh, we've talked a lot about filmmaking and what you all do. I do want to give you a little bit of time to talk to people about how could they um, get in touch with what it is that you all are doing. What, what, uh, what would you recommend to people from that, from that level? How do, how do people find out what Wind Rider's doing? Yeah, so we, you know, we did. We're known for doing two things, which is we have a big event every year in January at the Sundance Film Festival, and uh, you know, we physically go to the festival, and we are usually 300 people strong, and a lot of young people, uh, undergraduates, students, graduate theological students, folks from Dallas Theological Seminary join us, Fuller and others, um, and then we have a lot of community leaders from around the country that come to Sundance, and so I. Um, you know, you can go on our, our website, which is uh, www.winrideinstitute.com, and you could – is that right? I'm looking at my producer. <laughs> I'm going to restate that so you're, so Ryan can recut it. You can go on www.winrideinstitute.org yep. and find out what's going on relative to what we're doing at Sundance. And then we partner with groups like yours, Daryl, to um, to license content and to make it available to your audience. And so what – what we're trying to do from a distribution standpoint is rather than go directly to the consumer ourselves, uh, which is one way to do it, we work with groups that want to cultivate uh, and curate content that we would have and then bring that to your audience. So, Daryl, we need for you all to partner with us to get some of this content to your audience because we think it's worthwhile. And now our library is significant. And so we have a lot of offerings. So I will be would, calling you as soon as we're done. <laughs> okay, and <laughs> we'll we'll I, I nail it. So. We'll, been, we'll nail it I'm down. No, I I, I, well. I actually have an. I, I, we're actually doing something here that's a new initiative for us that puts us in the position to do something like that. So, um, so my friends and I will be calling you uh, very very soon. Um, uh, so, uh, could churches connect to this? I mean, you know, you said groups. So, how does that work? And then I do want to allow touch a time for you to talk about what you're doing with Christian colleges and, and seminaries. So let's talk about churches first. 
Yeah, churches, uh, you know, really, uh, churches could connect, but by and large, you know, there are pastors who are really already there on the, uh, they're already working with media and working with, uh, with film. And what, I think the biggest challenge, Daryl, that we're seeing out there, so we talked about the production side, yeah. we talked about the distribution side. Well, now the amount of content available to everyone is overwhelming. And what we endeavor to do at Windrider is to really take the curation role very seriously. So we really think our highest and best service to any group, but this is in particularly interesting to pastors whose time is so limited, is we do the curation of the films and the the W episodes for the conversation. We go as far as creating discussion guides that we call exploration guides. And so, yes, pastors can connect with us on that same w- website uh, to, to figure out how to use our content. But I think that's at the end of the day, you know, we can kind of stream through all the noise and then just the abundance of content, which really can be overwhelming. Uh, um, and we try to curate content with an eye towards usage uh, in ministry context. So um, so I'm, I'm thinking about this, you know, people have, have had book clubs for years. You could theoretically have a Windrider club in which you look at a different piece each time you meet. Um, how, how vast is the library? That would be, um, I think, a uh, question. Our, our, our library is already up to 50 films, and we will have over 100 by the uh, the end of this year. Oh, wow. Okay. So that, that could keep the club going. Uh, Club's going to be busy. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Talk about what you do with schools. What are you doing with schools? You know, um, I'm a big fan of CCCU education, Christian colleges and universities, and, um, you know, it's a very challenging time to be a Christian college today. And, and within our partnership with AEI, we work with them. And a lot of those students are Christian leaders in secular schools. So we have a real heart for the next generation of Christian leaders. So oftentimes people think of Windrider as about a film group, but we see ourselves as a both and yes, we attract the next generation of storytellers and filmmakers. And that's important for sure. But for every one of those, there are 20 emerging Christian leaders coming through the undergraduate ranks, and they're going to go into any vocation, could be in ministry, could be outside of ministry. And so we feel like if you're going to be in leadership in any way, to have your thumb on the pulse of what's happening in the cultural conversation is critical. And so at Winrider, we are trying to say, this is what's happening on the front lines of culture. Some of it's hard to watch. Um, some of it, you know, you don't, it makes you uncomfortable. And, um, we feel, though, that the young people today really need to be able to see what's happening uh, out there on the front lines. And in many ways, we would say we're training a generation of first responders hmm. to be, by the time this challenge comes into their context, they're not surprised by it. They've already been in the trauma of it. They've seen it. They've um, they've known how to respond. And so when it comes to in their context, in their sphere of leadership, they're ready to to deal with that as it happens and so it's sort of like at the sundance film festival as an example for an undergraduate student to go you're going to see cultural conversations that are going to be coming into your context six months down the road a year down the road and it really gives you a chance to think through what you think about these things and um how to respond to them and to have a ready response Hmm. um and a gracious response because the complexities of life today are um, are numerous. Yes. So that's why we have a heart for young people. And, you know, we know, um, as it relates to the faith conversation, that, you know, young, for, for the first time, young people are, you know, uh, leaving the faith and, and not returning uh, when they hit adulthood. And so it's very important for young people to also see the— uh, the beauty that undergirds um, our faith tradition. So uh, I'll ask you, this will be my last question. Um, what is the challenge that you see in, uh, if you were to think what is the biggest challenge uh, in, the, in the arts area, uh, what, what would you see that as being? And, and then what advice would you give to people who observe the arts from a Christian point of view about that challenge? Well, I think when you start with the arts, the biggest challenge is to be an artist right now. Mm-hmm. It is very difficult to be an artist because it's uh, it's difficult to earn a living as an artist. It's difficult to 
be understood as an artist. That's why I recommend Mako Fujimura's book, Faith Plus Art, to your audience. Um, I would say it would be, it's important for those that are not, they don't consider themselves artists in the truest sense of the word, uh, painters, sculptors, craftsmen, artisans of any kind. The church needs to surround those folks and to to help them providing resources, buying their art, you know, be an art buyer. Um, I love to buy art from local artists. I, I like to think about a place in my house to where um, a piece of art is needed and then go find that from a local artist. And so I think in many ways, the challenge of the arts is that our lack of appreciation, understanding of the artists and the need that we have. You know, we work really closely with the international arts movement and, and um, we hear that over and over again from artists across the board um, just to be recognized and seen and come alongside as a valuable part of our communities. And and now more than ever, you know, artists are, uh, we have a little, little video with Mako that he said, artists are like honeybees hmm. and uh, they pollinate. Hmm. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's, we, we need artists. So kind of a long answer to a short question, but it's, I spent a bit of time on it because it's near and dear to my heart. Yeah, well, um, I mean... And, and that's how I got involved originally is by coming alongside artists and being in the room with them as they're trying to present and sell their art, uh, standing with them arm to arm. I think it's an important thing, and there's a lot of gaps in our communities around that. Yeah, when when the culture is only filled with art coming from somewhere else without asking some of the questions that the kinds of artists you are highlighting are highlighting... Um, you know, then the challenge even becomes greater. So we need we need artists who can speak into the space, um, speak in quotes. I mean, you know, tell stories in that space, yes. and and in some cases just visualize in that space in a way that that causes people to reflect. Well, John, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. This has been a, a fascinating time, as it always is when we interact. Uh, I will be calling you. We do have an idea in the back of our heads for what it is that we're thinking about doing that I think will. Continue connect with what you all are doing. So um, just great to be with you uh, again, uh, as always. And uh, I want to thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Great to be with you and your audience. You're very, very welcome. Uh, thank you for listening to the Table Podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please head over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you wish, leave us a review on the Apple Podcast. Uh, that always helps more people find us. And uh, and and we're like we're like Wind Rider. We want to be found. So because. Uh, uh, because we think we have something worth finding and reflecting on. So thank you for being with us, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.